different word. No, it was it was a different meaning. It was a different meaning. Okay, now girls. One day, one day. Who was here last week and I got gave you one of these? You still have them? You have these guys, the ones we didn't use. You have them? Because I don't have enough. Okay, I got two new ones here. Yes. Um, you have these? Remember from last week? It's page 108, not page 100. Page 108. If you don't have them, we got a problem. If you do have them, it's good. You have it? Very good. Okay. Oh, this week is yes. It's uh, this is not this week. It's this mood. <laughs> whatever we think, whatever we want to do. Everything. Okay, shall we? Okay, so by popular demand, we interrupted learning Siddish. I'm going to remind you that every week, by the way, because I took that personally, <laughs> <laughs> and we bent back to learning Siddish. And we're going through the Chumash. That's what we're doing. We're going through the beginning of the Chumash. I started maybe 10 years ago. We're learning the Rebbe Sichas in the narrative. We're learning the stories. We're not learning the Halachas. We're learning the stories of the Chumash. And the story we're currently learning, I want to call it the first day. The day that the Jewish people arrived at Har Sinai. The first day. And this is our third class and our second Sichas. Okay? We already had two uh, classes where we discussed the Jewish people's arrival at Har Sinai. And the last thing that we learned was fascinating, I think. In that Sikha, the Rebbe discussed Ki'ish Echad, Belev Echad, rather than Belev Echad, Ki'ish Echad. Why do we say first Ki'ish Echad as one person and second Belev Echad as one heart? And the Rebbe's answer in short is, first we were a people and then we got a Torah. Ish echad, we were one people, believe echad in one heart and receiving the Torah. That's in short what the Rebbe told us in the previous Sikha. Now, we're moving on to the new Sikha. I actually copied these last week. And as fate would have it, we didn't get to it. So we're doing it today. We're starting today this new Sikha. I hope to finish it today also. The subject matter is as follows. The Jewish people are traveling. And they're traveling very fast. And remember, they're cumbersome. The Jewish people are not 12 chevre. They're a few million strong. There's 600,000 men from the age of 20 to 60. And then there are many children. There are many senior citizens. And there's an equal number of women. And then there is also an aid of Rav, a whole multitude of people that joined along because they thought it was, a good, it was a good thing to join. So you're talking about several million people traveling through the desert in, a, in, a, in mass, in one large group of people. And they would rest and they'd set up camp, they'd put up tents, everybody had to have space, they would set up camp. Later on, they would determine that the Shvatim would be situated separately, Reuven, Shimon, and God in the, in the south, and Yehuda, Yitzhakar, and Zul in the east, and Don Naftali and Asher in the north, and the, whatever it is, God, Asher, and somebody else, I've got them all mixed up. But they, would, they, would, they had a whole arrangement of how they would sit. And the camps of the Jewish people, all told, was 144 square kilometers. That's how I understand it. I consider a mil a kilometer. There were 12 mil, 12 times 12 is 144 square kilometers, which is a considerable area, but it's not a million miles. That's what the, the camp was basically a square. The problem is they keep moving. They keep moving. In the last five weeks, they've moved a half a dozen times. And every time they move, one takes down their tents, packs up all their belongings, prepares all of their livestock, and then they march. They come to a new location, they settle, they build a whole camp, they put up their tents, they pitch their, their livestock to some kind of a post. I don't know what it was. They stay for a couple of days, and then they started all over again. And they're moving very, very rapidly, moving very fast. As it turns out, I can't hear you. I don't think so, no. They put up their tents. I mean, they, I don't know what kind of furniture they had, but every place that they come to, they settled. Now, in the course of 40 years, they would travel 42 times. But you must understand that probably half of those 42 journeys were in the first and the last year of that 40 years. For, for, for 19 of those years, they sat in one spot in a place called Kadesh. So 
the 42 journeys, which take place over 40 years, are not on average one a year. In the middle years, they travel very infrequently, but at the beginning of the journey, the end of the journey, they travel a lot. And as we discussed in the previous sikh, and in this sikh, it's going to become explicitly clear, the, each journey, each chanoya, each masa, is a physical trip. They physically packed up everything they had, they put everything together, they bundled it up, they, however they travel with, with donkeys or with wagons or with a combination, and they moved to the next place, they unloaded, they set everything up, they made it all beautiful. Sometimes they stayed a day. Sometimes they stayed two days. And each place that they came to had a permanence. You know, there's a halach and hilchah Shabbos, which the Gemara brings, that according to most opinions, a desert, a midbar, is considered the Mokhaim Ptur. A desert belongs to no one. A public domain belongs to everyone. A desert belongs to no one. A Mokhaim Ptur is not, is not considered a property. It's not a shus. When the Jewish people traveled through the desert, because the Shechina traveled with them, because the Besamekta traveled with them, Wherever they came to, became not a desert, it became a public domain, it became a Rishus Arabim, it became a question of traveling on Shabbos. And the way it's explained is that every trip had a permanence. They came to a place, they established themselves in a very permanent way, even if permanence was 24 hours. They packed, unpacked everything, they set everything the way it's supposed to be, and then the next day God said, move, they moved again. And Hasidus adds, from the Baal Shem Tev, and then after the Baal Shem Tev, and so on, that every physical journey is a spiritual journey. Every time they move physically, they were being told to move spiritually. They move 42 times because there's 42 steps in a person's spiritual growth. That's what the Hashem says. Every time they're moving, they're not just physically packing up all their belongings and moving to a new place and unpacking all their belongings and reestablishing themselves in that new place. They were spiritually changing from one form of Avaita to another form of Avaita. And the most important challenge that exists in this process is speed, rapidity. They're moving very fast, very fast, very fast, very fast, very fast, very fast. Now, why are they moving this fast? Because God is moving them that fast. Why is God moving them that fast? Because God thinks they can. He's a pretty smart guy, God. You know, he's a pretty smart guy, right? He made the program which runs our supercomputer. So he pretty much understands how we operate. And in the midbar, he said, I'm going to get these people to meet the potential that they have as pretty close to perfectly as possible. And this is the rapid movement. The rapid movement is a symptom of Hashem believing that we're ready to move. But here was the problem. He thought we were ready to move. We didn't think so. For every journey that he gave us a week, we thought we needed a year. For every journey that he gave us a year, we thought we needed a decade. For every journey that he gave us a decade, we thought we needed a century. We were moving much slower than him because we were stuck in our yates and hara and Hashem was not playing along. Hashem wasn't being a nice guy. Hashem was expecting us to follow his lead and go out into the desert and move at this incredibly rapid pace to get to the promised land, to get to Eretz Nishof, to come into Eretz Nishof. I heard, I heard, you know what I heard means? I don't know, but I heard this as a bacha. I've never seen the letter, but there's a rumor. And you know, Mr. Rumor is very hard to sue because he can't seem to find it. But I heard, as a child, I heard this 40 years ago. When I was a kid, as a teenager, I heard. When the Rebbe first became Rebbe, he wrote a letter to Anash and Yisrael, to the Chassidim and Yisrael, and he said to them the following. He says, we can approach this in two ways. Number one, we can work very, very, very fast and very, very hard to read Mashiach very, very quickly. Or we can take our time. And it'll take forever to Mashiach to come. And I propose that we should work fast and bring Mashiach fast. That's what I heard. I heard this as a child, as a teenager. And if you've ever seen the Rebbe's correspondence in the first few years after he became a Rebbe, you can feel that urgency. Do it now. Do it now. Don't wait till tomorrow. And then at some point, the Rebbe actually if you're allowed to say this, sort of slows down, but you can see in the letters in the beginning, incredible urgency. Shem is moving the Yidin incredibly quickly, and they never feel ready physically, and more importantly, they never feel ready spiritually. Now, let's say something nice about the Jews. <laughs> let's say, even though we're Jewish, let's say something nice about the Jewish people. Our partnership in this undertaking, in this endeavor, was our amunah. 
We were slaves for 116 years. We were slaves for 86 years, whatever number it was. And we were broken. We were broken. We were so broken, we didn't have any ego. We had no will, we had no self-identity. And the Abishta made us into a nation and he gave us an ego and he gave us a will and he gave us free will very rapidly, very, very fast. And he did everything. He made one miracle and a second miracle and a third miracle and a fourth miracle and a fifth miracle and a sixth miracle and a seventh miracle and an eighth miracle and a ninth miracle and a tenth miracle and an eleventh miracle. What was our role? To trust him. That's it. Like it says in the Siddur, which is based on the Pasuk, that we say in Reish Hashanah, I remember the love of your youth, the affections of our betrothal. When you followed me into the desert, to a land which is infertile. In other words, Abay Sayyid went out into the Midbar. Hashem did everything. He gave them Manmen Hashemayim, He gave them water from a rock. He gave them Anani covered clouds of glory that protected them. What was their role? Trust him. Trust him. And the Abish to challenge us so much that we found ourselves having a hard time trusting him 10 times. Like it says in Hashem really pushed us to the edge. Hashem wanted us to trust him so much that Yidin were seeing witnesses, miracles. Yidin saw miracles day after day after day, had a hard time, had a hard time adapting to the divine expectation. Because it was happening so fast. That's the story. It explains a lot of things. It explains all the complaining. It even in some level explains the ego. Hashem is pushing them. And he's pushing them on a faith level. He's not pushing them to, to, to pick up another rock. He's pushing them to trust him and to believe in him in a very, very extreme way. And they didn't have a hard time with it. So Rashi articulated. Rashi describes the difficulty that the Jewish people had in moving at the speed of God. That's basically what it is. To move as fast as Hashem wanted for them to move. And he uses two words. Tarumis and Machlekes. Tarumis means complaining and Machlekes means arguing. And I explained it to you. Who were they complaining to? They were complaining to Why are you moving so fast? They were complaining to God. Machlekes, they were arguing. Who were they arguing with? With the person in the next tent, their contemporaries, their friends. They complained to Moshe that Hashem is moving them too, fa too fast. And they argued with their friends and what is the meaning of this move? What does it mean they're moving now? What does it mean? Spiritually, what is the meaning of this move? So call Shara Chaniyas, like every time they traveled and rested, to the Abish they said, excuse me, I need another week. And to one another, they argued what it means. With one the one exception is, when the Jewish people left this wonderful place called Refidim. And they traveled one kilometer for some opinions, 2,000 numbers. To Har Sinai, nobody complained and nobody argued. Beli Tarumas didn't complain to the Ebishter. Beli Machlekes didn't argue with one another. They sort of understood and they appreciated why they need to do it. And they also agreed as to what they were trying to accomplish. There was no Machlekes. This is the story of what we're going to call Monday, the first day in the month of Sivu. We're going to follow the Shit of the Rabbana, not Rabbi Yesi. Monday, the first day of Sivan, the Jewish people moved from a place called the to a place called Sinai, and everyone was thrilled to move. Ish Echad, one person, they had social unity. Belayv Echad, with one heart, they had religious unity. Torah Mitzvah unity. No Tarumas, they didn't complain to Moshe why they're moving again so quickly. And no Machlech, they didn't argue with one another the meaning of the move was. All the people came to an Amek Ashavah, they came to a depth where they all agreed. Questions or comments? Questions or comments? Now, to embark on a sikha, which you have in front of you. And as you all know, you want to follow the classes that I give, just look at the underline, okay? If you have the copy, look at the underline. If you follow the underline, you'll be fine. If you wander away, you'll be wandered. You'll be lost, okay? You'll be wondering. Follow the underline. This is a sikha where the Rebbe is going to further explore the significance of the fact when they came from Rafidim to Harsina, they were Ishachad Levachad, this one man with one heart, and the Rebbe is going to study what and why, but he's going to add a kvetch. There's a kvetch. The has a kvetch, has a nuance, has a tweak. The kvetch, the nuance of this sikha is, Raboisa, the kvetch and the nuance of the sikha is, 
that would unify the Jewish people, that they neither complain nor argue, was Torah. The power for this unusual event of unity, where they didn't complain to Moshe that they're moving too fast, and they didn't argue with one another about the meaning of the move, but they sort of all appreciated, this is the right thing to do, this is how it has to be done, this is what needs to be done, and so on and so forth, is connected to Torah. Torah created peace. The Apostle says, Shalom, Torah is called Oiz, and Torah is called Shalom, peace. And at Har Sinai, when the Jewish people traveled the short distance from the feet of the Sinai, they in, encountered this inner peace, this inner Shalom. And that was, the, in other words, it's the, the peace of Torah. And it was the basis for why they all understood that they need to move. And they all agreed about the meaning to the move. There was no Tarum, with no Machlekes. They weren't complaining, and they were not arguing with one another. Questions or comments? No questions, no comments? Where is it? Where is it say that? The what? The Torah is Ayyub and... It says in Pesukim, it says in Chazah, it says in Mishnah. Okay, I'm going to leave the room for a minute. I have to get a good coffee, but I'm going to fall asleep. Do you have the copy from last week? What does this mean? That you're never engaged, is that what it means? No. Uh, I just, yeah, I made it, I made it for you. So let's repeat this one more time. We're learning the second sikha on the same exact idea, right? The Jewish people rested adjacent to the mountains. There's one person with one heart. And as she says, whenever the Jewish people move and rest, they complain and argue. And we're going to be nice and we're going to say they're complaining to Hashem that their avoid is happening too fast. They're arguing with one another about the meaning of the avoida. But on this occasion, they all agreed. And again, what's unique about the sicha is that the Rebbe blames it on Torah. Or to contrast it to the previous sicha, right? The whole point of the last sicha was that it was Kiish Echo, the unity was a familial unity. On the Shama one, it's not a Torah one. It's this Sikh is going to argue that the source of their unity was Torah. You could almost say that the last Sikh and this Sikh is like a hand and a glove. In the previous Sikh, the Rebbe says they haven't received the Torah yet. So the unity came from their familial, from the fact that they were one family. This Sikh is going to blame the unity on the Torah. So let us proceed. Okay, now you know how it works. Just follow the underline and you'll be good. Israel adjacent to the mount says Rashi is a mechilta. This is mechilta. Call Mokem, Weimer, wherever all other places it's written. But Yisro vayachanu, they traveled and they rested in plural. They in Lashon Rabim traveled. They in Lashon Rabim rested, which the mechilta interprets nesim b'machlekes. They traveled with divisions. The chayim b'machlekes, they rested with divisions. In other words, they had disagreements about why they're traveling and where they're traveling to. Here they all had one heart. This wasn't the Mechilt. Now Rashi says, and I didn't underline Rashi, it's the next paragraph, like one man with one heart. Every other time they traveled with Patrumas, they complained, the Machlekes, they argued. Now, of course, I want to understand something. I'm teaching you Sikhs, but I'm being bad. I'm always bad, yeah? I'm manipulating the Sikhs. In other words, I'm not teaching you the Sikh necessarily the Pasha, the way the Sikha was designed. I'm teaching you the Sikha in concert with our vision that we're trying to study the narrative, the story of the Chumash through the prism of the Rebbe's learning, the Rebbe's thinking. So this Sikha technically is an analysis of the difference between two interpretations of these words, the Mechilta and Rashi. We're not going to notice that. We're going to sort of skim over it. We're simply going to explain, like I said to you earlier, how the Jewish people achieved the unity, how they usually argued and usually complained. Here they achieved the unity. And the big idea of the Sikh is that the unity has to do with Torah. So let's go. Page 109, second column. Lay the Mechilta, according to the Mechilta, which is a Medrash, is the Peter from Machlaikis, when it says that they argued, not in the Zin from Vigin Zich, they were, no, I skipped. Go back. 109, first column. 109, first column. When Rashi zok, when Rashi says, every time they traveled, they complained and argued. 
meint er de meint er the minion for tarumes from achlekis in poshut and zin. He means they were complaining and they argued very basically. Kinegerai, they were unsettled. They were they were not getting along. Yeah, you ever watched a film of walruses on a beach? <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? You may have not watched the film of walruses on the beach. It's, it's not that important. But walruses live in the Arctic. It's very cold. And they're very well protected by their blubber. Right? But they haul out on the ice or on land to, to really warm up. And they also haul up on the ice to molt, to lose their old skin and to get a new skin. And when they're molting, they're very itchy. They're always scratching against the rock because they're losing one layer of skin to get a new layer of skin. So the beaches are very crowded and they're constantly jostling. You know, these are big, massive two ton creatures or one ton creature with tusks that are almost as big as the size of tusks of elephants. And they're pushing and they're jostling. You know, so you finally get comfortable. Two minutes later, another guy has got an itch and the whole colony is fighting again. And then they wrestle down. And that's how it goes. Yeah. That's, that's, if you want to understand that, it a bunch of people. If everybody in his own place is good, but if anything changes, everybody is out of sorts. Huh? Like Tisha in 770. Like Tisha in 770. Um, and, and this is what's happening with the Jewish people. Every time they move, there's this, you know, there was an order. Everybody found their place. You know, I'm laying on the rocks in this position. I'm laying on my left side. I got my flipper here, my flipper here, my toss to face it in this direction. One guy moves and the whole situation becomes a, a domino effect. When you stay in one place, it's good. You start to move, everything goes nuts. Sadashi says that's what happened. Every time they travel, they complain and argue. Why? Because they're not they're not comfortable in the transition, they're not comfortable in the change. So they're literally fighting with each other. Those walruses, they hit each other with their tusks. You know, it's a nest, they have skin this thick, otherwise they kill each other. Okay. So the Yidna complaining and arguing, not in some esoteric and mystical and lofty way. They're complaining and they're arguing because they're posh irritated. They're out of sorts. That's Rashi's position. Second column, 109. Like the Mechilta, as opposed to the Medrash, is the Pirish from Achleikis. When it says here they were divided, nit in dem zin von kriegenzich, heipach hashalom. It doesn't mean in the literal sense, as Rashi holds, that they couldn't get along. They were arguing, they were fighting, they were washing machining. Nor heipach von leivecha, they were lacking one heart. In other words, Deus, the argument according to the Kilter was much finer. They were disagreeing about philosophy. Whereas, since the fact is that no two people have the same mind, and certainly no two Jews have the same mind, is that many people do something the same. Muzin, it needs to be. I'll be tevin naturally. To emerge, to arise, to surface. Fashid in a deus, various approaches, v dos to ton, how this should be done, okay, it's a mess. So Rashi holds, they were fighting with one another. The Mechilta holds, they were disagreeing with one another. Fighting means they couldn't tolerate each other. They were like disturbed by one another. Disagreeing means they, they you know, they, they respected each other, but they had different approaches. Now bracket, now girls, this bracket is the source of this idea that I've been teaching forever that the things they were complaining about and that the things they were arguing about were spiritual. Look inside, please, right here. According to Hasidus, and in footnote 12, there's a bunch of sources. In the name of the Baal Shemdin. As the Membe is Masoy is At the 40, 42 journeys through the desert, Zainim and Amis are an illusion, they're a hint. Of Membe is Madreges Valias, 42 steps and 42 ascents. In Avaita Hashem in one service, Akadish Baruch. Now, girls, in case you do not know, the Baal Shem Tev says that in the beginning of Pasha's Masa, you have the 42 journeys that the Jewish people took through the desert. The Baal Shem Tev says that every single person in his entire life has 42 journeys. The Baal Shem Tev further says every Jewish, every human being in the course of a whole year has 42 journeys. The Baal Shem Tev further says that every single Jew, every single day has 42 journeys. There's 42 stops that you make along your day in terms of relationship with HaKadosh Baruch So the Rebbe says, So if a Jew in a lifetime and in a year and in a day has to make 42 stops, there's obviously going to be differences. Between each individual Jew and the community as a whole, 
Because by Yederin, by each individual, is the Ali Omasa, the ascent and journey, like Zaindag, in other words, based on his step and his form of Avedis Hashem. Okay. Lloyd uh, Zayn, based on his personal levavcha, nafshecha, moidach, his personal heart, his personal soul, and his personal strength. This is anti Semitism at its best. I just fixed this last night. I refuse this to work. Anti Semitic. <laughs> I'm cuckoo, right? I know. I know, I know, I know. Okay, I don't know. See what happens if I turn off the Wi Fi. Sorry for interrupting. It's people who have been complaining that the classes have not been online for about a week, so I, uh, you're not working. Uh-huh. You're a bad guy. I don't know what's going on. I have to speak to my guy. Yesterday we fixed it, but now he's like sort of letting me know I'm not working. 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 What can I do? Okay. Shall we? Please, let's continue. Norda, only in this case, by Derchani, this particular journey, for Matan Teira, is given a chidr, something unusual occurred. The, the nation of Israel rested adjacent to the mountain, says Rashi, says the Mechil to Hushful Levach, we suggests had one heart. Standing next to the mountain. So Kabbalah Satayra, to receive the Tarek Makadash Baruch Hu, is a Hushful Levach, and we acquired one heart, which means we all share the interest in the receiving the Tarek, identically. We all took the Tera, the same Tera. We all took it the same way. We all took it with the same attitude. We took it with the same spirit to the argument. Ain on the Zelba level, we had one single heart. When I feel in it, they evolved it ever since. They didn't even have a with two hearts. The two bases would mean Nevshel Kis and Nevshel Bamis. The one base means only the Neshama. The Jewish people had one heart, just the Neshama, where they were all unified in receiving the Tera. Why? Vaila, the reason is. Taira, Taira, come. But two of them, Shalom Bishlaim, has turned to page 110. That affects peace wholesomely, completely. Hadjapoyot Anachtos created a unity, Gemuru, which was whole and perfect and complete, sufficient, needed one to one another. Biz, to the extent, as a Zanyan Batal Gavarna Zerich Lugadeus, there was no, the Batal Zerich Lugadeus, there was no difference. Normally, when they traveled, they argued about the travel itself. They argued about the travel itself. Why is Hashem making us move? What is the meaning of this move? And so on. Here, they're not arguing. And the reason they're not arguing is because they developed one singular heart to receiving the Torah. Because the Torah created a unity amongst them. Now, let's repeat, let's repeat, okay? I make a living in repetition. If I couldn't repeat myself, I would have run out of things to say 20 years ago. In the last Sikha, the focus was on the Ki'ishachot. That the unity amongst Jews was not about Torah, it was about their Neshama. In this Sikha, the basis for the unity is Dafka the Belevech, of the one heart, the Torah. So we learned two Sikhas in succession, and by the way, they happen to be printed in Lukut the in the same volume, volume 21, one after the next. The previous sikha starts on page 100. This sikha states on 108. It's two successive sikhas. And they're giving you two different spins, two different perspectives on the basis for the unity. In the previous sikha, the Rebbe insisted that the unity, Kish Echad, had to do with their neshama. And in this sikha, the Rebbe is going to argue that the unity has to do with the leiv Echad, has to do with the Torah. How do you reconcile this sikha? And this sikha, for this, you need a third sikha, which I don't know if it exists. But this is what's going on. The Mechilta said they disagreed. Rashi says they argued. But here, both the Mechilta and Rashi agreed. They didn't disagree. They didn't argue. Everything was peaceable. Everything was good. Because they all came to a place where not only they agreed about what they need to do, they also agreed why they need to do it and what's the motivation. Where did the strength of that unity come from? The strength of unity came from the Teda itself. At your own risk. Go ahead. Uh-huh. Um, question? Oh, it's very cool. Okay. 
Um, question or comments? Go ahead. So both of them agree that the unity was from the I can't answer that question. The wording of the Mechilta is Kan Hushfu Levech. The wording of Rashi is Kish Echad Bil Levech. So the Mechilta for sure has all that the unity is the Torah because the meaning of the word Lev is desire. What was the object of the desire? The object of the desire was Torah. Rashi could be spun both ways. And in the previous Sikha, the Rebbe chose to make the issue of the Kish Echad. And in this Sikha, the Rebbe is aligning Rashi with the Mechilta that the issue was the Levech. Mechilta is one of the oldest Medrash. Well, you have a Gemara, right? The Gemara follows the order of the Shisha Star. We have books that were written at the same time as the Gemara and the Mishnah. But they don't follow the order of the Mishnahis and the Gemara, they follow the order of the Chumash. And there are a number of Medrashim, but there's one Medrash which is called Halacha, it's Halachic Medrash. And it has three, it's three different books, three different names. On Bereshis and Shmois, on Shmois it's called Machilta. On mm-hmm. Vayikra it's called Safra or Teiras Kayanim. And on Bamidvar and Dvarim it's called Sifri. So Bereshis doesn't really have Machilt, as far as I know. These three Sfarah, they're called Medrashim, but they're really Halach. And they're the same Madrege as the Gemara. But instead of following the order of the Mishnayis, Brachas, Peyad, Maik, Elayim, Shviyas, and so forth, it follows the order of the Pesukim. So these three Medrashim, in particular, the Mechilta of Safra, called the Tedas Kenim, and the Sifri, are very often quoted, not only as a Pshat, an Apostolic, but in a Halacha. So it's a very important medrash, in other words, a very reliable and important medrash. It's as old as the Gemara, and it's equal to the Gemara in its value. And in many dinim, in Shulchan Aruch, are not based on the mission of the Gemara, they're based on the Sifri, or the Safra, or the Mechilta. Okay? So why isn't it so popular? Why do we hear about the Gemara and not this all the time? Because you don't go to school often enough. Okay, now you know. So let's go, girls, let's go. So in this sikha, that we're not accepting the version of the previous sikha, which was strictly Rashi, that the unity had to do with their nishamas, but we're saying that the unity had to do with the Torah, the Torah brought them together, and the Torah created peace between them. Was dafazi only the Torah, Tut uf, the Maila reaches the level for Nushu Lev Echad, not Ish Echad, like the previous Yikha says. Lev Echad, one heart. Says the Rebbe, next underlying document, Friar Magdalene at the top is first, but, but the Apostle is, the Apostle says, as Vayich and Shamisal, Neged Ahad, when did the Jewish people come to Harsin and achieve this unity? Vayish and Lachid, the Jews rested at the mountain, they became one. Hatechuf Kitan Bachid, the Shashlishi happens in the third month. Now, this is, we're going to break now, okay? Now, in other words, usually I break later. I'm breaking now because I want to divide today's class, not by chronology, by minutes, but by topics. The first part of the class, we introduced the Rashi and the Mechilta and the fact that we're saying that the unity of the Jewish people, the first day they arrived at Harsina is about Torah, Levechod, not about their Nishometh, Ishechod. The second class, which I'm going to be given momentarily, has to do with the unity comes from Tere, but I need to keep talking. I love to talk, okay? I don't know how to stop talking. I want you to know something. I'm asking you a question. Is the Tere a source for peace or is Tere a source for strife? Both. I didn't ask you a philosophical question. I asked you a personal opinion. Oh, Will the world be better off without the Tere or with the Tere? Does Tere bring people closer together or does it make people fight and argue? So here's a Gemara for you. This is not a Mechil, this is a Gemara. The Gemara says that the reason Har Sinai is called Sinai is because Sinai has the same shade as the word sin of. Hate. Misham yard the sin of the Midbars, the Matan Tata brought hatred into the world. Now you figure this out. The whole we say, Aina, the Vesta, the Nitna Tata, the Sholom, the Elam, the Shem, the Shem, the Shem, the Shem, the Shem, the Shem, the whole lean of Tate is Shalom, and the Gemara says that the source of all politics is Harsina. 
if the Abish had not given Nehra Chas Sholem, you could make a case, everybody would get along. Why? Because nobody would believe in anything. There's nothing to argue about. Nobody hunky dory. The Torah created sin. The Gemara says. So I'm asking you. If the Gemara says that the meaning of the word Sinai is sin all, that from the giving of the Torah came hatred to the world, how come we're insisting and there's Mishnayis like this and there's Medrashim like this and there's Gemaras like this, that the source of Sholem is Torah. What is the answer to that question? Go ahead. You can't have one without the other. Which one? Hatred without Torah or Shalom without Torah? Both. But the Gemara says Sinon. Okay, what I'm trying to say is that you can't hate someone if, if, if you don't have any relation. Yeah. Very interesting. So you give me a psychological explanation. It brought us close enough together that we should actually hate one another instead of care about one another. Okay, I like it also, but we're not going to accept it. We want a better tennis. Anybody else? The question is very plain. The Medrash and the Mishnah say that the Tate is source of Shalom, and the Gemara says the fetish that the, all the hatred in the world comes from the Tamat and Tate. I'm going to tell you the answer. It's, it's really common sense. In the Rebbe's language, in our Rebbe's language, and he would say it again and again and again and again, there is a, Sholem has a last name. Sholem's last name is Emes. Sholem Amiti, true peace. What is true peace? That it's not compromise. If you believe in one thing and I believe in another, I say, okay, we're going to get along because I'm going to stop believing what I believe in. You're going to stop believing what you believe in, or I'm not really going to believe it, and you're not going to really believe it. And we're going to get along. That's not Shalom Amiti, that's Shalom. It's called Pshora. Pshora means compromise. You know what else has the same shade as the word Pshora? Melting snow. That's true. Dilution. It's called pshara, lahafshir, to dilute, to melt, to thin out. That's not peace. That's, I don't care. <laughs> if I don't care, you don't care. We can get along. In other words, people can disagree. And there's two ways to solve those disagreements. A, to not care about their opinions. So they get along, I don't care. B, to get along in spite of their differences. So the Gemara says, I want you to know all the hatred in the world comes from Tata. Why? Because Tata has opinions. And the opinions of the Tata, the world disagrees with. Some people disagree with these opinions. Other people disagree with opinions. So the Tata made all kinds of trouble. Why? I'm going to use those bad words because the Tata actually means it. The Tata means what it says. There's a right way to live and a wrong way to live. It's not however you live is okay. Everybody can choose their own path. There's a right way to live. It makes people angry. And if not for the Tata, Rahman and Islam, you'd all agree because we didn't care about anything. But on the other hand, what the Torah empowers is that you're entitled to disagree and you can be very vehement, you can be very argumentative, you can be very vociferous, you can really argue and you can come to a place of peace. I'm not backing down from my position. You're not backing down from your position, but we still get along. So both ideas are true. Misham Yod the Sinal Eilam. The Torah creates in the world combativeness because Torah stands for something. And people who stand for things are going to get into differences with other people because they're not going to back away from their ideals, from their beliefs, from their principles. But at the same time, Tata teaches that one of the principles that we could have, that we could disagree and still get along. And that's called Shalom Amiti, real truth, real peace, as opposed to bluff peace, fake peace. I visited a certain city in the uh, Northern Hemisphere. I'm not going to say what country I was in. And it was many years ago. And in those days, I mean, Lubavitch, Baruch Hashem human beings, which means we don't always always agree. If, if, yeah, Lubavitch is 28 years since Gimel Thomas, it's 30 years since Chazai, no, they were doing amazing. But we don't all agree on everything. So I showed up in town and I asked a friend of mine, what's going on in this in this city? He says, we, it, it, nobody fights outwardly. <laughs> we all get along. Inside, we all disagree. Outward. So he tells me in Yiddish, a false shalom is better than a a false peace is better than a true war. <laughs> false peace. You know, I don't agree with you, but I keep my mouth shut. You keep your mouth shut, then we get along. A false, a false shalom, a false peace is better than a true machlekes. And I agree with him. 
I've been living in Lubavitch my whole life. I know what machlekes looks like. I know what arguing and fighting looks like. It's bad. When a community is divided, when a family is divided, it's terrible. So if you get along because you make believe and you don't push issues, it's better than a, a real machlekes. But the ultimate better benefit, the ultimate good, is that it's not a false peace, it's a true peace, right? What's the example we have for this, Rabbi Yisai? What is the example we have for the idea of true peace? What is the example in our history we have for true peace? You know what the answer is? And it's a weird example because it's inverse, it's backwards. Rabbi Kivis, Talmudim did not get along, remember? And they died in the course of a few weeks. What's the expression in the Gemara? They couldn't show each other covered. They disagreed. And the Rebbe says in the Kutasichas, what do they argue about? They argue about the teaching is that they're teaching Rabbi Kiva. What's the most important teaching of Rabbi Kiva above all the other teachers of Rabbi Kiva? So they argue about Abbas Yisrael and they argue about Abbas Yisrael to such an extent that they couldn't respect each other and boom. You get it. Now, Here's what you got to understand. Here's what you got to understand. Rabbi Kiva lived after the destruction of the Second Temple. Rabbi Kiva was alive during the uprising of Bar Koichva, which was about 70 years after the Khurban. Rabbi Kiva was murdered at that time. So the students of Rabbi Kiva were way after the destruction of the Second Base Hamik. Okay, now, who were Rabbi Akiva's teachers? Who were Rabbi Akiva's teachers? Huh? Rabbi Kiva's teachers were Rabbi Yezab ben Hurkanus and Rabbi Shoah ben Hanania. You couldn't find two Jews with more different backgrounds. Rabbi Shoah ben Hanania had a mother at Tzadikis from the cradle she raved in for Teda. Rabbi ben Hurkanus had a father, a multi-millionaire, and from the cradle he raised him to be a millionaire. And he ran away from home when he became a Tana. His story is written down in his own medish called Pirki de Rabbi Yezab, where he tells his own story. And Rabbi Yezab ben were like a Tzadik and a Balchur. They had very different backgrounds. But they together led the Jewish people after the Chum. And Rabbi Kiva was one of their disciples. Who were the teacher? Who was the teacher of Rabbi Lezim and Rukim Shev and Hananya? Rechen and Zakai. Who was the teacher of Rechen and Zakai? Hillel. The Gemara says that Rabbi Yechem and Zakai and Hillel had 80 Talmidim. The greatest of his Talmidim was Rabbi Yechem and Ezeel. And the youngest, the smallest of his Talmud was the Yechem Zakai. Imagine he had 80 students, the smallest of his students was the Rebbe of the next generation. So Rabbi Kiva's students were the students of the students of the student of Hillel and Shammai. Now try this on for size. Listen to this. I love to say this, and I've never seen it many say that. I don't know why people don't read this. Base Hillel and Base Shammai argued a lot. Oh, right. Hill and Shammai argued three times. Beis Hill and Beis Shammai argued repeatedly. And the Gemara says, why? Why did they argue so much? And the Gemara answers, because Loi Shimshu called Tarka. The Paskin Halachas is not enough to learn Torah. You have to have Shimush. Shimush means you need to sit by the feet of a Rav, a Tadik, a God will be so Paskin Halachas. And watch how he applies halachas to life. There's a very big difference between a law written in a book and a law that I love Paskins. Because the Rav Paskins is a third dimension. It's the person, the human being. And proper Rabbonim, what made you a good Rav was not how much Torah you knew, but how much Shimush you got. Years ago, Rabbonim would get 10 years of Shimush. They would sit by a practicing Rav for a decade before they would start to practice. But you didn't have a lot of Tzadis. It was before the Churban, before the destruction of the Second Temple, but it was the last hundred years when the Romans came into Etzisro, and it was a disaster. So people were recruited to be Rabbonim with not enough Shimush. And that's why they argued. Traditionally, when rabbis argued, they would sit down, they would talk. And almost in every case, they'd come to a consensus, to an Eim HaKashav. The Gemara says that before Hillel and Shammai, there was one Machlaikis. One, one, uno. Everything else they result. And the Gemara tells us what the Machlechus is, was the Machlechus about Smichi. Hillel and Shammai, who were the last of the Zugis, argued about three things. And the Mishnah tells exactly what those three arguments were. Beis Hillel and Beis Shammai have hundreds of arguments. Why? Because the more training you get, the more you learn how to listen. 
And the more you learn how to listen, the more you learn how to converge your thinking with your thinking of the other person. And you're not, you back away, you find the MS, a true peace. So listen to this. The Bakiva's Talmudim couldn't respect each other and they were killed for it, right? Their Rebbe was Rabbi Kiv. His Rebbe was Rabbi Shur. His Rebbe Yechem and Zaka. Rabbi Yechem Zaka was a member of the Academy of Bethlehem. Now, listen to what the Mishnah says. In Mesech Diyavamas. Some of the arguments with the Bethlehem and Meshama were so serious that Bethlehem could hold that if a man marries this woman, the children are going to be the Achman of the Fan Mamzerim. Illegitimate. Today for children, they can't get married. And Beishamai will say, no, no problem. It's not a child at all. They can get married and the children will be a Yimuyuchas, will be a Koyen, will be a lady, can be a Koyen. Other issues was other way around. That Beishamai said that if a man marries this woman, the children will be Mamzeidim. And Beishil said, no, nah, no big deal. And in Mesechti of Romes, and Mesechti of Romes is a very hard Mesechti, you find many cases where Beishamai is actually lenient and Beishamai Hill is actually strict, where Beis Hill is more afraid of Mamzeidus than Beishamai is. And they have a lot of arguments with Masech the a lot of arguments. And some of those, many of those arguments are such that Beis Hill holds this marriage produces a mom. Some Shami says it produces a Kayim Gadol and vice versa. And then the Mishnah says, Beis Shama and Beis Hill made Shaduchim for each other. Members of the Yeshiva of Hill would make Shaduchim for the members of the Yeshiva of Shama. And members of the Yeshiva of Shama would make Shaduchim for the Yeshiva of Hill. And nobody ever questioned. It means Beis Hillel knew that if someone from Beis Shammai is going to propose a girl, he's not going to choose a girl based on his opinion of whether this is a good shidduch or not. He's going to choose it based on Beis Hillel's opinion because he knows that this person whom he's presenting the shidduch is a member of the Academy of Hillel. And if someone from the yeshiva of Beis Hillel would make a shidduch for someone from the yeshiva of Beis Shammai, they wouldn't even ask. The Chevraman from the Yeshiva Beishamai would know that Beis Hillel would never present to me a Shidduch to the Shailan, the Jiribis of the Shidduch, according to his opinion. So think about this. How many generations are there between Tamid Rabbi Akiva and Beis Hillel and Beishamai? Beis Hillel and Beishamai also argued a lot. Hillel and Shammai only argued three times. The generation before Hillel and Shammai only argued once. Beis Hillel and Beishamai argued many times. But when those arguments became personal, there was not an argument. Beis Hillel respected Beis Shammai so, so much that even though Beis Hillel, he knew that Beis didn't think so, he would propose the Shidduch. And Beis Shammai respected Beis Hillel so much that even though Beis Shammai held that this Shidduch would be a mamzer, an illegitimate punishment, Beis Shammai knew that this particular rabbi in the yeshiva, Beis Hillel, thinks it's a kosher Shidduch that would propose it. Now, this is psychological. This isn't just religious. This is called maturity. The Bakivas tell me they couldn't respect each other, couldn't have disagreed. Just three generations before, they argued about a bunch of stuff, but it never became personal. That's the tight shalom amiti. True peace doesn't mean we get along. True peace means our disagreements aren't personal. I don't hate you because I disagree with you to such an extent that what I consider a mom that I'll propose to you for a shidduch because I know you hold it isn't. That's greatness, Rabbi Yisai. That's greatness. And everybody talks about the Tamid Rabbi Akiva. <laughs> Nobody talks about the Silam Mishame. I wonder why. You know, come Svira Soimir. We'll talk about just three generations before the teachers of the teachers of the teacher of the Rabbi who died because of lack of COVID. Had so much covet. Beis Hillel and Because no, no, no. no, no. they didn't have that. They couldn't. Because they disagreed in Torah, they couldn't get along personally. So this is what the Gemara says. Har Sinai, the word Sinai means sin or hate. Hatred comes into the world from Sinai. Why? Because the title stands for something. Yeah, but the Rebbe says in our Sikh, and it's again, it's a Mishnah and it's a Mendrish. The Kulni Sikh is there, Shalom, the whole Taita is true. The answer is, yeah, of course, Taita is true, but it's Shalom, it is true peace. True peace means I don't back away from me, you don't back away from you, but it's not personal, it's Taita. So when you're on a lower level, the disagreements in Taita create hate, like Nikamara says. But if you're more deeply connected to the Torah, the same Torah with its disagreement and with its principle 
brings out Shalom. Do you understand? Isn't that sweet? I'm going to take a break. Okay, we're going to come back in a few. I'm going to learn the second half of the Sikha where the Rebbe is going to explain to us why Torah is the source of peace. And I'm repeating one more time that in the previous Sikha, the whole argument was that the unity came from their Nishamis, not from the Torah. But in this Sikha, we're saying the unity comes from the Torah Daft. Okay? I'll see you in a few. Chazak. Okay, so here we go, girls. What's going to happen now is that Eber is going to present us with an explanation for why Torah is the source of peace, and it's really interesting because it's it's actually really logical, upsettingly so, if I may say so. The Eber's idea is very interesting. Um, and what the Eber does to make his case is use numbers, one, two, and three. Tayyid is the number three. The Ted was given in the third month. The Gemara says that everything about Tayyid goes in three. It was given in the third month, on the third day, by the third child. The Ted has three parts. Tayyid gave two of them. There's a whole bunch of threes. Everything goes in three. And the Rebbe is going to use the number three to argue the idea that Tayyid is connected to peace. Okay, now, do you all have your sikhs? It's a yes or a no, or don't bother me. What's your name? I don't have any more. What's your name? You've been here before? Yeah. Are you on my list? No, I don't think so. Lama Law? Yeah. Oh. Sharona Sharona. Oh. Last name? Becker. Becker. Shall we? Okay, everybody else was in the first period. Okay, Davai, let's go. Page 10, bottom of the second column, please follow inside. Okay, Darfman, Friar, Magdimzan. In order to explain the relation between Taita and peace, and again, as I explained to you in the last few minutes of the previous class, it's not peace, it's peace in spite of principle, in spite of principle, I believe what I believe, you believe what you believe, and we disagree vehemently, but we don't hate each other. Okay, that concept of peace, uh, which is called Shalom Amiti, requires, uh, it's connected to Torah. How do you explain it? That's my free and but the Pasuk is Magdish, we have to preface first what the Pasuk says, <laughs> he, the Jewish people as a singular unit, rested adjacent to the mountain, Says the Rebbe Hatir Uvgeton, it took place by Chodesh Hashlishi in the third month. The Tzayis B'nei Yisrael at the time after the Jewish people left the land of Egypt. But the fun is verstanden. If you understand the meaning of the number three, you will understand as the Vayichan is forbidden the midamayla from Mispar Shlishi that the idea of resting and becoming a unit is connected to the number three. And again, I sound like a broken record, but some records are meant to be broken. In this sicha, it's not about a neshama unity; it's about a Torah unity. And the unity is connected to the number three, page 100. Just the underline, please follow. The chiluk in remes, the difference in the hint of the substance. What's the difference between uno, dos, and tres? What's the difference? Is echad, the number one is madgish underscores, as is da melechat chilo, not ain't zach. All you have is one thing. If all you got is one thing, you have no choice but to get along, right? You can't argue with yourself unless you're a Meshuganet. Shani, vice the Fischalkus. The number two obviously shows on division. Hey, Pacha'ach is the opposite of two because when you have more than one, you got more than one. Top of the second column, page 111. On that Uftu from is what is special about the number three is, was that is Ma'ach and The two, which are by themselves distinct and separate, are joined. Okay, does anybody disagree with those interpretations? Speak now or forever hold your peace. False peace or true peace, but you'll have to hold it. Everyone's happy, so we're moving on. Okay, I'm moving too fast for you to figure out how to disagree. One means there's nothing to fight about. Two means division. Three means we get along in spite of our differences. That's the Debbie's position. Now, we bow, that's page 112. Now, we bow, that's Chazal Chabindin Tehra. 
Bechlal. Mitzvah we know that the Gemara says that there's only the number three. Therefore, a standing this indicates it means to say as klolos in in a Torah, the Torah as a whole is beduk masayin for shlisha machria. Is similar to the third degree. You see, if you and I disagree, and she gets an argument, yeah, is she a third opinion? The yes or no or don't bother me. You and I disagree, and she gets involved. Uh huh. Where's she? She either agrees with you or she agrees with me. Correct? Mm -hmm. So we still have two opinions. And then she gets involved when we got two opinions. She gets involved when we have two opinions, just more people screaming and shouting, right? Mm -hmm. But there's something called Shlisha Machria. The third person actually does something very, very subhuman or superhuman. They listen, they pay attention. And they listen to what the woman says, they listen to what Shimon says. They don't take a side. By hearing both voices, they find the truth. This is called hachro'o. Hachro'o means resolution. I don't want to use the word compromise, although it could be interpreted as such. Hachro'o means you find the place where the two opinions actually agree, if you go deep enough. So you have every day we say it in the evening. The third opinion is not agreeing with A or B. It's a third opinion that's resolving the difference. Now, it could be that outwardly he's agreeing with me or he's agreeing with you. Possible. But what he's doing is not saying, I'm taking a side. I like you better than her. What he's doing is he's going deep enough into the idea to find the place where the two opinions converge, when the two become one. So when Torah, and you have this in Mishnah and the Gemara, you have it in Gemara. And you have a this is called Shlishia Machria, where the third guy is not just agreeing with one or the other, he's being, he's resolving the conflict by going deeper. He's not taking a side, it's not two against one, it's one against one, and some guy who's able to find the place where those two would converge and become one. That's called Akhra. So the Rebbe says the whole Torah, the entirety of the Torah, is like the third guy who's making resolution. Now, do Jews argue about absolutely everything in Torah, or there's some things they don't argue about? So we're going to say, for the purposes of this conversation, because this is what we want the answer to be, that there are things that nobody argues about. <laughs> we're going to make believe that the correct answer to the question, there's some things Jews don't argue about, because this is the answer we need for our discussion. Okay. Says the Rebbe, if there's an issue in Torah that we all agree about, we still say Torah is given in the third month on the third day, by the third child, on the Torah, the book of three. Why? Because even when Yidin don't argue about a particular idea of Torah, we don't say he's one day. Uh, we say he's the depth of what would happen if there was an argument. And that's what the Rebbe is proposing. Torah is connected to the number three, not only in those parts of Torah where there's an argument. Torah is connected to the number three, absolutely, meaning, even if there's a point in Torah where there's no contention, nobody disagrees, the Torah brings out an opinion that has a depth as if there was an argument and there was a third guy who agreed. That's the proposal that I was making. The Gemara says in the Sech to Shabbos that it's called Orientally Soi, the Torah of three, La Amati Soi, to the nation of three, Kailu Bibish Elim, the Yermatli Soi on the third day, Thursday, Friday, Shabbos, Ayadei Soi, so the third child, Aaron, Miriam, Miriam, Aaron, Moshe. And it's a Torah of three, Torah of him, and the Rebbe brings always Nesichas, that are this and gone on the margin of the Gemara himself. Everything about Torah is three. Says the Rebbe, you know what that means philosophically? It means that the Torah has an integrity as if every single point in the Torah was argued and they came to a depth of not compromise, but resolution, unity, hachra, and even issues in Torah that nobody argues about is connected to three. It has the depth as if there was an argument and the argument was resolved. That's the Rebbe's proposal. That's what the Rebbe just said. I want to read it again. Bitte, I'm reading it again, okay? Page 112, first on the line. We bowed as Chazal verbinden Torah bechlal. Mit dem Mitzvah von Shlishi. Since the rabbis, the Gemara, connects Torah as a whole 
So the number three is the fun fashtandik. This means to say, as klolos inyan teda. The whole idea of teda is bedugmas, who speaks Hebrew. Thus, similar to ha inyan fun shlisha machnir. Even if there's an inyan of teda, nobody argues. Everyone agrees. But the connection with the Teda, the number three denotes that that idea that everyone agrees on is as if they disagree and they came to a depth called Machrosh, Lisha It's a philosophical idea. Teda is not an opinion. <laughs> it's true. Because it incorporates all possible opinions and it comes to a depth, a place where they agree. Most issues in Teda, they argue about and they have to find that depth. Issues in Teda that they never argued about. In the first place, Teda finds that depth by itself, and that's why Teda is connected to the number three. Now let the Rebbe do the talking, okay? Let's go. Let's haste in other words. Afilu and di erter. Even in those cases. For the psak halacha from Teda with a verdict, with the resolution of the Teda, is begolu nitan even fanachra. It's not resolution. It's not making both people right. It's either taking one side over another or issues with nobody argued about in the first place. It says the Hey Luke Rebbe, and I'm only reading the underline, is as Abar Be'amitis Uba Plevius. The truth is, and the depth is, an Inyan Fanachra. Even when something in Taira is not like a third entity that's being Machriya, that's resolving, the difference is every idea in Taira is on that level. Because when rabbis argue, and they argue quite vehemently, vociferously, passionately, and then they pass him, the Allah was like you and not like him, then the Deus Hachilkis, the rabbis who disagreed before, maskim to their halacha, agreeing with the opinion which they did not hold before, need not have been again, myself, not just practically, but also in their minds. Says the Rebbe in Yiddish, Leitzich up vidi halacha. It suddenly resonates with them also that what the halacha was determined is true for them as well. And Azoi, in such a way, as Azvet, that Shalom Amiti creates true peace. Sishin Yaldei is in the very spring. And here the Rebbe uses the word Amiti, Shalom Amiti. So rabbis argue, right? I was told by my technician I shouldn't clap because when I clap, the computer goes cuckoo. Rabbis argue. Rabbis argue. And then they sit around and some, they get together and say, he's right and he's wrong. Now, sometimes when you say he's right and he's wrong, we're just simply taking a side. Sometimes when we say he's right and he's wrong, we find a depth that incorporates both opinions that comes to a resolution. But the Rebbe says, whether the rabbis simply choose one side over the other, or the rabbis find an emek ashava, a depth which incorporates both days, the losing rabbi now agrees with the winner. He actually understands that what they're doing the other way is actually correct. His brain changes. During the argumentative stage, they argued. Once they found a way of determining what the law is, either by choosing one opinion over the other or by finding resolution, which incorporates both theories, the, 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 the opposing point of view, the one who lost the argument now understands and agrees with the winning point of view. And that sounds like politics and diplomacy and double speak and manipulation, right? You know that the Rebbe's wife, the Rebbe Zachary Mushka, was a very, very smart lady. She was an incredibly, incredibly intelligent woman. And she had her opinions about everything. And she voiced her opinions to people who knew her. So I know more than one story where there'd be an issue raised to politics or social science. And the Rebbe would say what she thought. And then someone at the table said, you know, the Rebbe, your husband spoke about this. And he said differently. So immediately she would say, my opinion is, and she'd repeat her husband's opinion right away. So you look and say, eh, she was a weak woman. She was uh, second class. Her husband wore the pants in the house and whatever he said, she followed and she didn't have her own mind. But that's really not true. That's not who she was. She was very intelligent. She had very strong opinions. But she knew that her husband is on a higher level, not because he's smarter than her, because he's inspired. And when she changed her opinion like this, and she said, my opinion is such, she, she actually understood why. So the Rebbe says, 
whenever rabbis argue and they determine a halacha, all now agree to the position of the halacha. The ones who before disagreed have changed their opinion, they agree with the halacha. Now the question is two parts. Number one, what's the proof? And number two, how's it possible? If you want to have this big argument and then we, you know, everyone decided that you're right and I'm wrong, why would all of a sudden agree with your opinion? And the Rebbe is actually going to explain it to us. The Rebbe is actually going to offer us an explanation. And you know what? When we hear his explanation, we'll agree that it actually makes sense. But you have to add one detail to the conversation. For people to disagree. And then for another Chalgraman, a third guy to get involved and to decide like one or like the other. And then all three agree. You have to add one more component. You know what that component is called? It's a big bad word. It's a big bad word, very dangerous word, very painful word. It's called reality. Life. Torah is not philosophy. You understand? It's life. Ideas, you can argue till the cows come home. And by the way, the answer to most arguments with the level of ideas is who cares? <laughs> My students ask me, Rabbi, do we really have free will? We don't have free will. The only answer is, I don't care. <laughs> if it feels like free will and it looks like free will, it's free will. Conversation over. Yeah, but Rabbi, it doesn't make sense. Do me a favor. Don't be in a kettle. Torah is not philosophy. It's teaching us how to live actually, practically. When you add the idea that what Torah teaches you is actionable, you understand it differently. And that's what happens in an argument. Rabbi us argue. And one guy comes along and he adds to the argument the element of reality. And everyone says, oh, let's keep going. Okay, let's keep reading. Page 112, second column. Thus is the care of Torah, it's the power of Torah. Hashem has given us oiz, that means power to bring together opposites. And Hashem has blessed us with peace. And he explains. First of all, there's a give and take. There's a discussion. There's an argument about an idea. I say this, you say this. We take up different positions in the argument. When, however, men kum tsu, we reach the point to the resolution and decision of the Torah. And it may be the Ainif from the Stardust is following one theory and not the other. But there are two different happen of to figure out who's right. Figure out if I should listen to Reuven, listen to Shimon, you have to have, you have to have resoluteness, you have to have strength. Not strength to say, I don't care what you think. Strength to think it through and decide who's right. That it take you for hachlot the hardness of resolution to mulchama to a disagreement to mulchama hab me defeshkid and ertias to fight against the various other leanings in the shakal v'tari in the discussion in the dialogue in the debate. Un machias and ve'enef in the resolute resolve like one way. So the always means the toughness and the fortitude and the principle, the principle to go in one direction and the other direction, not let any winds move you off your choice. And then the Rebbe says, shalom. that's followed by peace. As Allah days, all of the opinions, Zayin the Noch made they eventually come to a place where they acquiesce, where they agree, where they concede. So that Allah to the law, with the entire form, they form a true joy, peace between them. And again, the Rebbe puts into the word emes. They argue. Rabbis argue, people argue. I, I, I watch myself and I watch people all the time. When I was younger, I would argue about everything. I mean, I, I had to so I just argue. And I would get very stuck. I was very stuck. I couldn't listen to what the other guy was saying. I couldn't hear his point of view. And the arguments were always butting heads, always screaming at each other. When I got older, I didn't have the strength to scream at my friends anymore. And, I'm in and I realized how stupid it is. I, I still argue, don't misunderstand, but I try not. The beginning of stopping to argue is beginning to listen. You have something to say, I have something to say. I'm emotional, you're emotional. 
The ideas can speak to each other. The emotions don't let. Because I am upset that you're disagreeing with me. The emotion doesn't let me hear you. I have no patience. When I would argue with my friends, they never had patience to listen to them. And the reason was I didn't have enough time. The truth of the matter is, had I listened to them, I would have actually saved time. But I was young and headstrong or headstrong. People who learn how to listen don't always find out that they're right, but they always find out what the truth is. And that's a lot more important than being right. And that's what the Rebbe is saying. Torah is a book that lends itself to a variety of views. There's machlaikis, disagreements, and the machlaikis are serious. But Torah also gives us the power, number one, to figure out which position is true, and number two, to reach a place of integrity where all the other opinions then join. Not by compromising, but by emes. How does that work? If five minutes before you and I were screaming and chatting at each other, we couldn't agree. Now that it was determined that I'm right. Of course, I'm always right. You're always wrong because how could it be any other way? Yeah, and then of course you agree with me. So the Rebbe says he got to add an element, which is the application of Tata to life. Bottom of page 113. I'm reading inside. P as Taylor is an Inyas and Chachma say. The idea of Taylor is wisdom and intelligence, right? Wisdom and intuitiveness. Like the Pasuk says, the whole point of Taylor is to give us wisdom. The whole point of Taylor is to give us understanding. Right now, you understand it your way. I understand it my way. I listen to you and I don't agree. You listen to me and you don't agree. So what's going to happen next? It says the Rebbe is Ober Farana Mailum Yechedes and Taylor. There's something which separates Taylor from other wisdom. I want you to know that I'm in the midst of an argument with a rabbi about a very sensitive question about education. You, you or I? Me. Okay. I. And my whole ambition is to hear what he says. It's very important to me. It's, it's not in my nature. My nature is I don't listen. I just talk. I have to break my nature and listen to him. But after I hear him out, then I need to make my own decision. So I'm having this argument. And part of the argument, at least from my end, is not to let it become emotional. I want to, I want to know what he's thinking. And I'm not just going to follow him. Then after I understand what he's thinking, I'm going to make my own decision. But I have to be able to hear him. And he has to be able to hear me. Now, if he doesn't able to hear me, if he gets emotional and becomes an argumentative, it's his business. Because the end of the day is it's my decision. I'm consulting him about a question, but the decision is mine. I'm going to hear, and I hope I'm going to listen, and I'm going to hopefully open my mind to understand how he looks at it. And then I'm going to make the decision myself. When I make that decision, it'll be incorporating what he suggested, but it's not going to be his opinion, it's going to be mine. That's very, very hard to do. Now, the reason it's so painful is because it's a chinuch question. What does that mean? There are children involved. They're real people. We're not talking philosophy, we're talking about real people. And real people are a part of the question. And the moment real people are part of the question, here's the tragic truth. If the people are different, the answer may be different, even though the Torah is one. The same Torah tells all people at all times to do the same thing, but when you have to determine what to do actionably, if you incorporate the element that you're dealing with people, it changes what the truth is. It changes the truth so much that everybody could understand that there's only one right way. When you argue before you incorporate the people element, you're arguing in theory, you have your opinion, I have mine, we can't agree. The, the third opinion is the third opinion rather than leaning in one direction or another because the third opinion says, okay, you say this, you say this, now let's see how this plays out in the real world. And that ever presents this to us by introducing us to a fascinating discussion. And the name of this discussion is Torah and Chochmah. Okay, let's begin. Are Torah and Chochmah synonymous or not? Are Torah and Chochmah one or are Torah and Chochmah two? Answer the question, don't be afraid, I may insult you, that'll be the worst. 
Torah Chachma, two different things. Anybody just go here, they're one. Anybody? Don't be afraid. I need to have an argument here, otherwise they're not Jewish. Uh, it's one, because Hashem's wisdom is Torah. Fair enough. So Torah is Hashem's wisdom, so wisdom is Torah. You say it's two. Now, why is it two? Because because uh, there's there's the Torah, and and then and then there's what Hashem is doing in like the Shabbos. No, don't give me Kabbalah. Talk to me plain English. Okay, basically. No, basically is a bad word, but I'll let you use it this week. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> no, the opposite of basically is precisely. precisely. Keep going. I'll tell you what I think. I'll tell you what you think. The difference between Chochmah and Taira is Chochmah is ideas. Taira's are ideas that you do. The integrity of Taira is not the theory. The integrity of Taira is that because of this theory, I'm going to make an action. That makes Taira very different than Chochmah. Chachma's ideas in theory. Torah's ideas that are attached to life. So the argument is the Torah on a theoretical level. The resolution is when you take this theoretical argument and apply it to real people in the real world in the real Torah. Let's do some reading. I'm starting from the beginning of the paragraph. 113, bottom of the second column. Afal P as Torah's idea for Chachma Vesech. Torah is an idea of wisdom and intuitiveness. As the Pasuk says, is your your bina. It's all about, however, at the same time, there is there's something distinctive about Taylor. Was as That wisdom as wisdom doesn't have. Okay. Chain Chazar in the language of the Medrish, yes, Tam. And if someone says Goyim have wisdom, it's true. Yes, Taylor, a goyim al tam, and the goyim have Taylor don't believe it. And I want to share with you a sweet story. Why do I want to share this? Because I chose to. That's the only reason. I am in Chinuch. I'm a teacher for 32 years. I started my first year was the summer of 1990, this winter of 1991, spring fall, fall winter 1991. It's about 30 second years as a teacher. When I started out, I was a young schneckel and I knew everything, you know, I, as time passes, I get dumber and dumber and I get more and more respected. I find that very strange, but that's the fact of life. When I started out as a teacher, my primary job was in yeshiva. And there were many senior teachers who are now deceased, who have now passed away alive. My, my, my first Rabbi Tenemam gave me, the, the, the principal of the school of Tenemam hired me, he passed away in 1993 or whatever, 94. And there's a whole series of people who I knew. They were seniors, they were on the way out, and I was a young guy. Some of them were Holocaust survivors who came to the United States and built families and built lives. <laughs> you have to put yourself on mute. At superhuman uh, cost and effort. And I was getting them at, on the downside. They were in their people in their 70s and 80s. One of those people was an elderly Jew who was incredibly sweet. He taught in the Labav Yeshiva his whole life. His name was Rabbi Garfinkel. He was a 10th grade Rabbi, the 9th grade Rabbi in, in Ocean Park Yeshiva. Rabbi Garfinkel was a, a bacher. He was a very, very Hasidic Shabbat. He was incredibly Hasidic Shabbat. I heard from people who knew him in Shanghai, China. He was a very special person. He came to America, and for reasons I'm not going to get into, he was a little bit isolated from the Chabad community for reasons that I can't get into. But in his heart, he was still a Chabadnik, even though in his outer appearances, he was a little bit more modern. And he taught in the Lubavitch Yeshiva his whole life till he passed away. So probably when he was in his 80s, he came to our Yeshiva, to Fabreng, and I actually wrote notes of that Fabreng, and I have it someplace in a folder. I sat next to him, and I, as he was talking, I was writing things down. And I found it amazing. If you're talking now 1995, 1996, okay? It's, 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 more than, it's more than 25 years ago that he came to this Fabrengen. And he sat with us and repeated a Fabrengen that he heard 40 years before. 
1940, 50 years before, in 1946. It's 1995, you're four, 50 years before. He was a Polish boy. He was a young kid. He was, I don't know, 13, 14, 15 years old. And he was in the Lubavitch Yeshiva. And when the war started, the Bacharim didn't know what to do. And they were told, go to the Rebbe's apartment, where the previous Rebbe was staying in Varsha. And when the Bacharim came to the Fidike Rebbe, each boy would walk in, and the Fidike Rebbe gave him money, either 500 zlotas or 1,000 zlotas. It was a lot of money. And he said, go east. Initially, east was Vilna, and then later east was, was Russia, China, Japan, Shanghai. Those people who went home to say goodbye to their parents never got out. The people who didn't go home to say goodbye went straight, survived. They went, they went to Vilna, which was on the Russian side of the partition. And when the Germans occupied Vilna, they went into Russia. They had the passports the, from Sugihara, the Japanese ambassador to Vilna. And they, uh, 5,000 people were saved by this one Japanese man. And they, first they went to Kobe, Japan. They were in Japan itself. And then in December 7th, 1941, when Japan attacked the United States of America, so the Japanese became very paranoid and took all the farms in Japan and moved them to China, to Shanghai. And in Shanghai, they suffered hunger and deprivation. It was very hard. They stayed there till the end of the war. Most of them survived. Almost all of them, some died, but most of them survived. After the war, and the whole time they were learning and diving, all they could do was they sat on the home. After the war, they got in a ship and they traveled. Uh, they traveled eastwards, right? They traveled. They traveled uh, eastward. They went around the world. They went from China through the Pacific till San Francisco, and then they traveled from San Francisco to New York by train. It took them more than a year. The war ended in April 1945. Okay, the Japanese war ended in August, September. They didn't get here till 46 and 47. It took them a long time to get here. They landed in China, in San Francisco, the boat, landed, and they took a train. I don't know the immigration details, why they were allowed into America. The bottom line is the group of Lubavitch and who came from the Far East all became American citizens, as far as I know. He was in that group, and I knew a man who was not a Lubavitcher, who lived in Shanghai, who told me that Rabbi Garfunkel was the most outstanding Bacher in the whole group. He was the most Siddish Bacher. They came here for Purim. I don't know if it was 46 or 47, but their first Fabregen was Purim. Now, 1946 or 47, the Fiedrich was still alive. Remember, right? Right? So our Rebbe was not yet considered the Rebbe. He was called the Ramash, which is an abbreviation for his first name, Shneers. This Rabbi Garfinkel, 50 years on, repeated the first Fabrengen that he heard from our Rebbe, who wasn't even the Rebbe, he remembered it so clearly. It was amazing. A kid should come from, from hell. And he lost his father, and he lost his mother, and he lost his brothers. And he, lost, he had nothing in the world except the shirt on his back. And he got married, and he had children, and he has a family. But then he was a Bacharel. Lands in New York. And the first time he's sitting at a Fabregen here in New York, next to the Rebbe, was put in. The Friedrich Rebbe was ill. They didn't even let him in to the Friedrich Rebbe. They were bringing downstairs by the Rebbe, our Rebbe called the Ramash. And he was able to repeat to us the Fabregen. What did the Rebbe Fabregen about this Medrash that we just learned? And I'm sharing with you because I want to share it with you. I'm a funny guy. Not funny, ha, ha, ha. Funny, interesting, funny. And I wanted to share this with you. And what he said, he remembered the Fabregen, repeated it to us. And the Chazal say, If you find, if somebody says non-Jews have wisdom, believe them. If someone says Jewish, the guy of Ted don't believe it. So what's in the Chachma and Ted? Chachma means knowledge, ideas that appeal to the human mind. What is Ted? We recently had a Sikh with a similar theme. Ted is also knowledge. But Torah incorporates into its knowledge, number one, something higher than knowledge, and number two, something lower than knowledge. What separates Torah from Chochmah is that Chochmah is strict logic. Chochmah is a body of logic that carries ideas that are higher than logic and carries them down to the level of action. 
So the Rebbe said, if someone says Goyim have knowledge, it's true. If someone says Goyim have Torah, meaning that their knowledge is connected to something which is above reason, and therefore it comes down to a level below reason, meaning it transits into action, God didn't give them that. God gave them to us. That's the Taich Torah. The Rebbe is going to use this very argument that I just presented to you to explain his point. His point is going to be, if two people disagree, how do they suddenly not only find the correct way to do it, but how do they suddenly come to agree? And the answer is because we're not dealing with chokhmah, we're dealing with Torah. We're not dealing with knowledge and wisdom, we're dealing with Torah. What's the difference? The difference is the one I just gave you, that Torah is not only wisdom. It's a body of knowledge. It's very intellectual. But in the Torah, you have what we call in our culture, Ein Seif, the infinity of God. And in the Torah, you have Lo Medrish Iket, Allah Hamaisa, that the Torah's purpose is to translate into behavior. When you add the idea above Chochmah and the idea lower than Chochmah to the Chochmah Satayra, this is why one is called Chochmah and the other is called Torah. And in Chochmah, you're not going to have Shalom Amiti. If they disagree, they're going to remain in disagreement. And Torah will allow for Shalom Amiti. And the clock has no heart and no mercy. And we got to stop. I was hoping to finish this here today. We'll continue with Mitzvah Shem next uh, Wednesday. Thank you for coming and listening. Chazak. We want Mashiach now. We don't want to wait.